Welcome to this Advanced Sedimentology Carbonate Systems module. My name is Sarek John and I will be your instructor. Behind me is the beautiful auditorium of the Department of Earth Science and Engineering at Imperial College London. Here we've been teaching traditional lecture for over a hundred years. But this is not a traditional lecture. This is a flipped classroom. It means we're using new technologies. It also means we have new opportunities. Throughout my career, I've been teaching carbonates in the field and conducting field research. I've spent countless months in North America, the Middle East, Europe, or at sea on research vessels. I want to bring this experience straight to you. So the philosophy behind this course is that I will teach theoretical concept straight at the outcrop. That way, you can see in the rock how those theoretical concepts apply. It also means that we'll have to travel the world. Are you ready for that? Then let's go. Look at that, it's spectacular. It's cold. It's because we are at 2000 meter altitude, so it's quite cold despite being in Oman. We're at the Shofet Al Alamin, the summit of the Oman Mountains. The reason I brought you here is because the rocks around us are carbonates and they're absolutely spectacular. So it's a beautiful place to start with the introduction to our class. So let's start with some learning objectives. What do I want you to know after you take my course. The first thing is, broadly speaking, what I want you to have is a, a really broad understanding of carbonate systems. And by this I mean really a full understanding of how carbonate fundamentally work. And we have a whole week to work towards that. And that includes understanding the chemistry of carbonates because carbonates are primarily chemical sediments. But despite what I just said, that they're chemical sediments, it's also important to understand that carbonates are mediated by biology. So that biology plays a big, big role in precipitating carbonates. So it's important to understand ecology if you want to understand what controls carbonate. And then of course carbonates form sediments. So we need to understand sedimentology, we need to understand sequence stratigraphy. And what's really interesting, I personally think, with carbonates is that their history does not stop with death. There is, there is a post-death history and that's called diagenesis. Diagenesis are in all of the processes that happen to carbonate after deposition. And that's also something that we need to understand if we want to be, to be able to understand the carbonates that we see around us here at Shorfet Al Alamin. But you might, you know, wonder why should you care about carbonates? This is a this is a fair question. Why do you need to study carbonates? And I'll give you two answers to that question. The first thing is that half of all the reservoirs are carbonate sequences. So that means that half of the hydrothermal reservoirs, half of the oil and gas reservoirs, and half of the water reservoirs are in carbonate sequences. So carbonates are very important and very abundant in the rock record. The second reason, and this is specifically looking at oil and gas reservoirs, is that all of the giant fields are in carbonate reservoirs and actually they're all in the Middle East. So carbonate sequences are extremely important for um, an understanding of the, the, the reservoirs. That's not where the story ends though. It's also important for you personally as young professionals to understand carbonates because I think there's an opportunity. And the opportunity is that the carbonates are typically more heterogeneous. So there is more heterogeneity laterally and vertically in carbonates. Added to this, there's also often more fractures in carbonate reservoirs. Now, 
This is, of course, a complication because it leads to variable recovery rates when you look at, at uh, field producing from carbonates. So this complication, you can turn it on its head and view it as an opportunity. Because if it's more complicated, it means that we've not figured everything out. So we need young brain power to look at these problems. And typically in a company, if you are an expert in carbonates, your pathway to promotion and success will be a tiny bit um, easier. So one thing I'd like to say, and this is a good news, is that you've learned already a lot about sedimentology. And you don't have to learn everything from scratch when you study carbonates. A lot of what you've learned in clastic sedimentology is equally applicable to carbonate sedimentology because carbonates are sediments. So let, let me give you a couple of examples. You've learned in clastics that the more you transport a sediment, the better sorted it becomes. Well, great news, it's also true for carbonates. The more you transport a carbonate sediment, the more sorted it will be. So the higher the hydrodynamic of the water, the system in which the sediment is deposited, the greater the sorting will become. It's also true that the greater the transport, the greater the rounding of the grains will be. And that's both for clastic and for carbonates. So the point I am making is that carbonates are sediments. So do not forget your sedimentology because it's completely applicable to carbonate settings. You will see bed form, you will see cross bedding, you will see all the things that you're familiar with in carbonates and in clastics. But there are, of course, differences. And perhaps the best way to express this difference is to borrow the sentence from Wolfgang Schlager, a famous carbonate sedimentologist, who said, carbonates are born, not made. And that kind of sums it up. It's because there is a, an influence from biology on carbonates that they are different than clastic sediments. Let me explain what this sentence truly means. And the first thing we can do is look at clastic systems. In this case, I'm showing you the coast of uh, the Western United States, California. And the point I wanna make is that in a clastic system like the one I'm showing you, all the sediments are coming from the rivers. So the rivers bring clastic sediment from land into the ocean and they're called point source system. The, the point of the source is the river. Once the sediment get into the uh, margin, into the continental margin, they are then transported by current. So in this case, it is the, um, the uh, longshore current that flow around the California coast that transports the sediments. So from north to south, following, following the Ekman transport. And those sediments eventually end up in the deep sea once they intersect canyons, there's a number of deeply cut canyons dating from the last glacial maximum that shun the sediment deeper into the system. So that's how a classic system works. You can predict where the source is by knowing where the continent is and where the river mouth is. It's your point source. And then everything is transported further and further away from the source. And of course, that means better sorted, better rounded, etc. For carbonate, it's very different because carbonates are mediated by biology. So that means carbonates will grow wherever ecological conditions are favorable. So here I'm showing you an example of atolls. Atolls are carbonate islands in the middle of the ocean. They can be really in the middle of the Pacific. They can be pretty much anywhere. In this case, we're looking at the Maldives. And the Maldives grow where they are because the ecologic conditions are ideal for them. The middle of the Pacific Ocean is a desert in terms of nutrients. We'll, we will see that this is important for carbonates. And they have found shallow water conditions which are absolutely essential for autotroph corals. So these are great conditions for corals and great conditions for carbonate to grow. And you can see the influence of ecology on where your source of carbonate is. And the source of carbonate is termed a carbonate factory. And we'll talk more about this in a few classes. Another point to make about carbonates being biological sediments is that the shape of the grains is controlled by their function. 
So clastic sediments can be easily approximated as beads of glass. That would be the typical shape for a clastic uh, grain. For carbonates, it's not the case. You see three examples here. On the left, you have an acropora coral. You can see that we have a metric size grain, which is effectively the structure of the skeleton of the coral. In the middle, we have a brachiopod. You can see we have two beautiful valves that are quite intricate. The shape of these uh, grains is, is very um, intricate. And on the right, we have a crinoid. And that crinoid also has a skeleton that is an articulated skeleton and is made up of hundreds of grains of carbonates that have a very specific shape. So the fact that biology needs a skeleton or needs a structure dictate the shape and the size of those particles. And these particles are formed in situ. They're not formed on the continent and transported for hundreds of miles into the ocean. They can grow wherever those ecological conditions are favorable. So again, that's a massive difference and we will see that the shape of the grain has implications for the pore network. So it impacts porosity and permeability of carbonate rocks. There's another aspect of carbonates that's quite different from clastic, and that is the chemical reactivity of the minerals that form carbonates. So let's talk about siliciclastic sand. Beautiful siliciclastic sand is pretty inert when it comes to diagenesis, certainly at earth surface conditions. So that means that early in the burial process or at the seafloor, there's very little that will happen to clastic sand. Very little diagenetic transformation, cementation, dissolution, etc., is not so common. Deeper in the reservoir at maybe four or five kilometers, things can change, but not at the surface. Carbonates are completely different because their minerals are very reactive. So that means that you'll have a lot of early transformation of carbonate minerals. Typically in the ocean, where water are super saturated in calcium carbonates, it means you can have early cementation. The implication of early cementation is tremendous. You're in fact, you're looking at this right, at this right now in this image. You can see that we have a reef with a flat top, but also a reef with a steep sided geometry. The only way you can pile up sediments to reach that type of steep sided geometry is if you cement them early, otherwise they would not be stable. And so we have lots of evidence for early cementation of reefs, which leads to early fracturing, but also steep sided geometries. Conversely, it's also very easy to dissolve carbonates early if the fluid is undersaturated with respect to calcium carbonate. And this is what you typically see in karstic system, in caves, which I show you a nice example right here. So the potential for porosity creation, but also for porosity destruction early in the diagenetic history of the carbonate is tremendous. And this is why diagenesis is such an important part of our class. Okay, so let's sum up what we've learned in this short class. First, we know that the the position of carbonates is typically mediated by ecology. So ecology is something important that we will need to learn. We've also seen that the shape and the size of the grains, the carbonate grains, can be quite variable. And that's important to keep in mind. Then we talked about early litification, the fact that the carbonates can litify very early in their history. Uh, but we also talked about uh, dissolution, and we know that dissolution can happen early or late in the history of the carbonates, just like litification can happen early and late, but typically will be early. And finally, we've said that all of these have a tremendous impact on the porosity and the permeability of the rocks. In other words, has a tremendous impact on the petrophysical characteristics of the carbonate. So that's why we need to understand them. Okay, well, that's it for this class. Now you're ready to start in earnest. And the next chapter that we will look at is the chemistry of carbonates.